Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here. You know, for all the dot-com and streaming media and all the rest of it, sometimes it's just great to get some time face-to-face -face and uh, exchange some views about what's going on. And that's what we'd like to do today. As you can see, the title of today's session is The New World at Your Service. What do we mean by that? Well, the new world is what we call this transformation that's affecting your business, driven by the Internet. And by at your service, we mean the services that are being designed to help you with that transformation. As we go through this hour together, we're going to be visiting with three presidents and CEOs of, the leading, of three leading service providers. So we'll look forward to bringing them out. But before we do that, let's get into some background information. Of course, it's, it's inevitable that you start a conversation with it like this. Uh, you have to talk about what's going on with the internet. Uh, the trick here is to try to figure out some way of capturing what we all know is a huge thing without being cliched about it. I thought this was an interesting diagram. We saw this in the New York Times. It shows how quickly different technologies have gone to 50 million users. And as you can see, the growth of the Internet is unprecedented, uh, faster than radio, uh, computers, even television, in terms of how quickly it, shipped, uh, it, it reached that 50 million user market. Think back to October of 1994. Where were you? What were you doing? In case you forget, that landscape first shipped the first commercial browser. And I remember the very first web pages I ever saw was when a, an engineer brought me in and showed me uh, what was then Digital Equipment's website. It had about three or four pages. And he said, this is the future. I said, I don't know, maybe. Who would have thought how much that w w of what has gone on since then would happen? So now think forward six years of the things that are, we're going to see uh, ahead of us. And it gives you a sort of a sense of the change that we have in, in store for us in the new world. Of course, as the people here who design the networks that support all this, one of the big challenges we have is the tremendous shift in the traffic we have. In the old world, the dominant traffic type was telephone calls. And the, the main thing that people had to deal with was therefore circuit switching optimized around that. But in the past few years, for example, I was just looking at Bell South's annual report that showed that a crossover in their network traffic has occurred uh, even there, where now they have more data traffic. And in fact, they're shifting to more packet switching. This is the big transition in our industry. Just about every news announcement you see, every merger or acquisition, everything you see going on can be explained in terms of this shift from the old world to the new world of the internet and packet switching. Now as the volume of packet switching increases, we see a corresponding uh, growth in volume and therefore decrease in costs. At the same time the costs come down, we see new applications be made possible. In a sense, in the world of telecommunications right now, we're shifting from a highly regulated, uh, price-constrained model to a place where a virtuous cycle, much like we've seen with Moore's Law in the world of processing, is coming to drive it. A cycle of growing volumes, decreasing costs, and new applications. But what kind of applications? It's worth asking the question because the kind of applications is changing too. Now, of course, in the past, most of the applications that you had to work on were inwardly focused, focused on the employees, serving the employees at your business. Of course, putting a phone on people's desk is, is sort of old news, but networking PCs is still fresh in the memory, and those sorts of client-server applications. But now what we see is a real shift outward, where the new applications are focused outward on the customers, suppliers, even shareholders and other partners. And we see this tremendous transformation in the enterprise, turning it inside out. This is why there's now so much attention from the executive suite on technology, because they sense it's no longer just a cost inwardly focused, but in fact a, an investment in their relationship with the customers and other key constituents that make your company successful. That comes with more visibility with both the good parts and the challenges that come along with that. It also comes with a new need. When you face your applications outward, it becomes much more necessary to work with service providers. Well, why is that? It becomes necessary to build that bridge to service providers because they're naturally in the business of connecting multiple parties together. 
It's relatively easy to build just a private network when all you're serving is your employees. But when you're facing outward, facing the customers, you need somebody whose specialty is to connect all those people up. Well, at Cisco, we're fortunate and we serve both markets. I happen to do marketing on a service provider business. Right now, that's about 40% of our business. And the remainder of the business is over on the enterprise side. And this puts us in a unique position to serve as a catalyst in helping to build these relationships between the enterprise customers who are moving into the new world and the service providers who want to help them uh, with the kind of services they're going to need to make that transformation happen. You may have seen a program we have called the Cisco Powered Network Program. And that program is really about helping make these relationships happen, bring the right parties together from those two worlds. Today we're going to look at three examples. We're going to look at a private label dial example where bluelight.com uh, is a new service provider being rolled out by Kmart as they build their relationship with their customers. And we're going to be hearing from ICG who's built out the infrastructure they needed to make that successful. We're going to hear from uh, about Plymouth Rock which is an insurance company in the New England area, and the way they're using a virtual broadband, a virtual private network on broadband, DSL, and how that was built by HarvardNet on their behalf. Finally, we'll hear from the Financial Times, one of the leading flagship newspapers of business news, and the way they're using digital island services to provide a global service with local relevance. The service providers here are really helping folks transform the business. And let's start with an example of people using access services to transform their business. This is a quote from the Red Herring magazine. In Red Herring, they were pointing out that some people are beginning to look not just at uh, providing a website to connect with their customers, but in fact reaching out and using access technologies to help build that bond with their customers even tighter, to get those eyeballs, so to speak. What are some examples of ways that people are doing this? Well, one example is Alta Vista, sort of a search engine and portal, who now is giving away advertising paid for um, free internet access in an effort to counter the package that's put together by AOL. After all, AOL offers content and access, and people like Alta Vista are looking to, to match or, or even exceed that proposition by making it free. Another example is a company called JB Oxford. They're a financial firm, and JB Oxford now gives you free access without even advertising, provided you maintain at least $2,000 in your account with them. Some of you may remember the days where when you opened an account at the, at the bank, you got a toaster. Well, no toasters anymore. Everybody's got a toaster. But uh, not everybody has internet access, at least free internet access. And so now JB Oxford does that as a way of bringing you closer to them and making those customers more loyal. One last example that's well worth looking at is companies with lots of employees. An example where they're understanding the need to provide them internet access as a key way of staying in touch. So for example, American Airlines now provides a PC, a printer, internet access, and access to their intranet with two A's, get it? American Airlines, intranet, uh, for the subsidized price of only $12 per month. So it gives you an idea of some of these different areas. Now, perhaps you're skeptical about the notion of using advertising to pay for internet access. But there's actually a very interesting historical precedent if you take a look at how much penetration we've had with telephones and televisions. You may not be aware of this, but in fact, telephones are only in slightly more than 9 out of 10 US households. Now, they're somewhat subsidized. The regulators have subsidized telephone service to residences uh, with universal service regulation and other examples uh, where they're able to essentially transfer revenues from the business customers to subsidize uh, uh, the residential access. Yet despite that telecom uh, regulation subsidy, the governmental subsidy, uh, nevertheless, the penetration is less than for television, which doesn't receive those kinds of subsidies but is fueled by advertising and as, as a result has uh, achieved almost 100% uh, penetration in the US market. So particularly when you think about things like digital divide and so forth, think about how powerful uh, using advertising to subsidize access may be in helping to address some of those issues. The example we're going to look at now is Kmart.